Hi, everyone, and welcome to Liberty Me Live. We're here tonight with the great Butler Schaefer, who is the author of quite a few books. Uh, he spoke to us two weeks ago about uh, calculated chaos, institutional threats to peace, and human survival. His topic tonight is uh, the topic of his book, In Restraint of Trade, The Business Campaign Against Competition from 1918 to 1938. Uh, professor Schaefer is a professor of law at Southwestern Law School in LA, and he is a, certainly uh, quite a figure in the liberty movement. He's known just about everyone. He's written on most everything, and he's always entertaining to listen to. So without further ado, I'll turn it over to him. Oh, thank you very much. One of the major tasks, I think, that uh, students of liberty and libertarians in general uh, have to carry out is to overcome the tendency for many people, many, I won't say many, some of them libertarians, but certainly people on the uh, political left who eat the big business system with the free market. And so often I've heard people speak who go on about all the problems that they note with the problems of the corporate state and the war system and the regulatory system and the bailouts and the self-interest motivation and so forth, and then will uh, ascribe all of this to uh, laissez-faire capitalism. That's what, that's what capitalism is really all about. And this is just utter nonsense. And uh, I, I think that from a libertarian perspective, uh, we really need to focus attention and help other people focus attention and learn that the system of big business and free markets are not only uh, not necessarily tied. I think I, I think historically they've been inconsistent with one another. Part of the confusion on this, I think, has come from people such as Ayn Rand, who, in spite of all of her other wonderful things that she's done, had written a piece titled America's Persecuted Minority Big Business. And how anyone can, can read that and think of companies like General Electric, General Dynamics, Monsanto, uh, Big Pharma, uh, Boeing, JP Morgan Chase, Citigroup, Morgan Stanley, all these corporations that basically give substance to the corporate, they they are what Noam Chomsky would refer to as basically the owners, and they, they make up that big body of people who are quote the owners uh, of the uh, political establishment that makes all these rules and regulations, starts wars and so forth for the uh, for their particular benefit. And I think that one of the things we need to focus our attention on is the the role that big business has had in scuttling free markets, or at least in trying to do so, and to, to focus our attention on how the choice is really between uh, big big business corporate enterprises as ends in themselves, or free markets as a process by which free men and women function. Uh, in the world without coercion. Part of the difficulty, I think, here uh, is well explained in a uh, work written by the late Leopold Kohr, that's K-O-H-R, for those of you who would like to follow up on this. Kohr had developed what he called the size theory of social misery. And in a book that he wrote called The Breakdown of Nations, he pointed out how uh, organizational size at any level of, of any particular substance uh, has very deleterious effects. He relates it to cancer. You know, a cancer, a cancer cell is a cell that has simply become, quote, too big. But at the social level, the political level, the economic level, uh, at, at which we are interested. Uh, he points out what has 
essentially taken place with regard to uh, political systems and economic systems that, uh, as he said, whenever something is wrong, something is too big. And this has been part of the theme that I've been playing around with for, oh gosh, <laughs> over 50 years now. Uh, I'll, starting out, I think I mentioned in my previous presentation here, when I was talking about uh, the Calculated Chaos book, how so much of my interest uh, was, was triggered by uh, a, some communication I had with Murray Rothbard, who put me in contact with at least the writings of Leopold Kor. Kor is, I'm sorry, not, not Leopold Kor, uh, Gabriel Coco. And Coco uh, was of socialist persuasion, but who pointed out how so much of the regulatory process that goes on in this country, antitrust laws, regulatory uh, statutes and agencies and so forth have been promoted by uh, business enterprises who are unable to accomplish their ends in the marketplace. And I kind of followed up on that and wanted to deal with some, try to, try to find some evidence that, that supported this. And I started off with the, the, the time period around World War I, when the, the, the bulk of American, you know, the American economy was under the control of a federal agency known as the War Industries Board. This was a governmental system that basically cartelized the bulk of American industry for the war effort. And when the war was over, it had a uh, built-in death date uh, and, and basically uh, took its well-deserved death. But many people in the business community really were attracted to the War Industries Board. And tried to figure out ways, propose ways in which that system could become a permanent part of the American political economic uh, environment. One of the problems that you have with efforts to stabilize, which means basically to control, to limit, to restrain competition, which is what these people were really interested in, is that when you do something like this in the marketplace, where the actions on the part of participants are voluntary, cannot be enforced, uh, they fall apart. Cartels, for example, are very well known to be terribly weak structures. If you had you know, 15 or 20 firms in a particular industry, let's call it the Economists fall back to uh, the, the widget industry. And the people in the widget industry thought that the good fair market <clears throat> price that God must have had in mind when he invented the widget uh, would be to have widgets sold at a price of no less than $20 each. And let's suppose that the going price in the widget industry is about, let's say, $16 each. And they're still doing all right. They're making some money. But the people in the industry that say, we're not making as much as we really should be making for a product as important as the widget. And so let's assume for the moment that they get together and agree upon a set of practices that would effectively keep the minimum price to be sold for widgets at $20 a piece. And they get together in a meeting. They, let's assume that they would agree upon this. Let's also assume that if everybody in, in the group, along with the agreement, followed that agreement to the letter, uh, 
the people in the industry, all of them, the industry as a whole, would be much better off uh, than under any other kind of system. This was a point made by uh, another economist, Mansur Olson, in his book, The Logic of Collective Action, that where you have a cell, uh, if people would in fact <clears throat> follow the agreed upon pricing system, they would all be much better off. Why don't they do that? Well, because here the, the collective interests of the group come into, into contact with the self-interest motivations of the individual firms. <clears throat> and as a consequence, firms that might show up at this meeting might agree, yes, we will uh, agree not to sell widgets for anything less than $20 each. That agreement will last about as long as it will take the people at the meeting to get to a telephone call the front office and say, yeah, we agree. We will adhere to that. That will be our list price. List price will be $20 each. However, uh, we will offer a generous trade-in allowance on your old widget. Or we will, uh, uh, we will carry the freight charges. Or we won't charge you any interest uh, for payments for a period of one year. Or we will do, do something else. And each of the participants is doing something along, along those lines. The net effect of that, of course, is to bring the actual uh, delivered price of the widget, even though in form it says $20, it can, brings it back down to a market level of about $16, and the cartel falls apart. Cartels in the marketplace, cartels that are voluntarily constructed, are terribly, terribly weak. And Olson points this out and saying, you know, the only way you can really enforce this is to uh, have some kind of coercion uh, to, 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 well, to support, to support the arrangement that <clears throat> to come a little bit later on. Right now, what the people in many of these industries were doing, and this was the gist of the research I was doing, which ended up in the, my In Restraint of Trade book, dealing with the period of 1918 to 1938. 1918 is about the time that the War Industries Board was sort of dying out. 1938 was the time period where the New Deal had had about five years of experience and a lot of Supreme Court cases had been decided at, up, up to that particular point. So I thought this was essentially about a 20 year period where we could see the role that the business community played in uh, restraining the energetic uh, pace of competition. They, they didn't like it. They really didn't. And so they started out by saying, well, all right, we, the antitrust laws prohibit us from <clears throat> having a formal arrangement to restrain prices and do things of that, of that nature. Um, but we can do some things of a voluntary nature, such as having uh, codes of fair competition. And one industry after another after another came up with these codes of fair competition, which was mostly boilerplate, you know, dealing with such things as, you know, if one particular firm had already uh, negotiated a deal with a buyer, another firm, it would be an unfair business practice for another firm to come in and undercut their price and, and so forth. A lot of things like this that uh, had more to do with the culture of competition, the culture of how firms in a particular industry would behave toward one another. But being voluntary in nature, it couldn't be enforced. Uh, they sounded good, and they might be used to kind of chastise your competitor at a trade association meeting or something like that. You know, you're really being very aggressive in your, your uh, competitive practices. And to characterize other people in the industry as 
practitioners of unfair competition. And what they meant by unfair competition was, of course, effective competition. You are being very aggressive. You're doing nothing illegal. You're not going out and blowing up your competitor's place of business or shooting anybody or doing anything like that. You're just being very aggressive. You're trying to maximize uh, sales and profits uh, to your particular firm. And that kind of, of aggression just didn't sit well with uh, people in the industry, particularly given the fact that the larger an industry was, the more difficult it was to be resilient, to be able to respond to competitive changes that, or competitive challenges is probably a better way of putting it, uh, of, other, of other firms. This is one of the things that Coco had pointed out in his book, uh, The Triumph of Conservatism, is that uh, larger firms became rather non non adaptive they couldn't they, they had so much inner bureaucratization stodginess so forth built in that they couldn't respond <coughs> excuse me as quickly as uh, effectively as could smaller firms and so they knew that if they were to maintain their size and this this goes back to my calculus book, when you're talking about, talking about an institution, an institution is an organization that has become its own reason for being. And it becomes an end in itself. Consequence, firms that have gotten to that position uh, don't want to have to uh, kind of give up whatever advantages they think they've achieved in their size by going back to the process that got them there and and modify that. We, we're seeing that today with the notion that, that a firm kind of might be look, too big to fail. This is, this is as good a, an example of what is meant by the plague, I think, of, of institutionalism as anything. When an organization becomes too big to fail, well, if it's too big that it can't respond to competitive challenges, if it can't remain creative, cannot remain resilient, uh, it should fail. Not as an act of punishment, but just as an act of, you know, if, you, if you can't, if you're no longer able to function in the market, given all of the size problems that you have, uh, maybe you should do something else. Well, <clears throat> when you're dealing with organizations that have gotten themselves to the level of institutions, uh, that's an unheard of kind of a proposition. They don't, you know, it's, if the organization is an end in itself, then instead of responding to the environment, we'll change the environment. We will make other firms unable or at least restrain them in their aggressiveness and their the energy they put into the conduct of their of their business but if we can't do this through voluntary means through the marketplace through these codes of ethics and so forth uh, what other avenue is open to them how can they respond well about 1929 something happened some of you may have heard about is called the Great Depression. And shortly after that, <clears throat> some of the people in industry saw this as a wonderful opportunity to provide for their purposes what a free market could not provide. A free market could not provide coercion as a way of enforcing the cartelization demands of businesses. Who could? Is there any agency out there that's in a position to be able to force people to do things they don't want to do? And have you ever heard of any such agency? Yeah, <laughs> it's called the state. And so the people in uh, these industries began to formulate some ideas, thoughts about how do we 
uh, how can we get the state to enforce our arrangements of what we would call codes of fair competition and so forth? I mean, everyone wants to be fair, right? Who wants to be unfair? Uh, and particularly when you tie it to the Great Depression, which meant that you were fixed way, or, or trying to fix it in a way that would deal with the <clears throat> uh, the harmful, detrimental effects that were being experienced in the Depression. Uh, you know, many people found this, you know, sort of a good, sensible way of of trying to resolve these problems. It began with. I think the first major effort to try to put together such a program began with uh, Gerard Swope, who at the time was president of General Electric. General Electric, as I, I suspect most of you are aware, is one of the big feeders at the trough of governmental regulation and tax feeding and, and, and the like. Uh, he gave a, a speech in 1931 to the, the Trade Association of Electrical Manufacturers, putting together something that was called appropriately, since it was his doing, the Swope Plan. And the Swope Plan involved having the, all the firms and give, uh, in specific industries industries such as automobile manufacturing, uh, production of steel, uh, coal, coal industry, uh, and on and on into the whole thrust of the American economic system, having firms in those industries be able to get together and formulate for themselves codes of fair competition, which could then receive the imprimatur of the federal government and thus be subject to enforcement. Now, if you engage in some activity that was an unfair method of competition defined by members of the industry, and now you had government problems to deal with. One might be uh, the withdrawing of your license to conduct a business. This is part of the one of the provisions of uh, firms that wouldn't play the game just weren't not going to be enjoying the license to conduct business in America uh, and so forth. There might be other penalties. And from about 1931 until 1932, the business community actively, eagerly, overwhelmingly, the, the, the big business industry, there are a lot of small businesses that oppose oppose this effort. But the big guys all were desirous of seeing this become part of the, we'll call it the new world order, that came, that terminology came later, but it's the same idea. This is the way American business and, and uh, uh, government were going to work together in some kind of a partnership or whatever you want to call it to uh, bring back recovery because we were in a great depression that the fact that the depression was caused by the government itself through federal reserve policies is something that you can take up uh, on your own with uh, murray rothbard's wonderful uh, critique of that entitled america's great depression uh, i won't go into that at this particular point but the economic ignorance of so many people assumed that, well, if we allowed businesses to correct these difficulties by getting the backing of the uh, federal government, uh, pretty soon everything's going to be, you know, happy days are here again. That was the theme song of the Democratic Party in 1932 when Roosevelt. Well, uh, many people like to attribute to Herbert Hoover, who was president when the Depression hit, want, want to blame him for 
for all of this. You know, the do-nothing president. Hoover was not, emphasis on the word not, a do-nothing president. Hoover was an engineer. What do engineers like to do? Engineers like to tinker. And as Rothbard points out in his America's Great Depression book, uh, he said there were a number of things that a government could do to prolong a if they chose to do so, and that Hoover did every one of them. In other words, the best solution to the Depression would have been hands off. This is what the government had done um, historically in, in, in prior depressions. You just let the market clear itself. For example, if you have surplus of, of, of production because of mis, in, uh, misinformation, misinformation of, of prices uh, occasioned by the Federal Reserve policies, what do you do? If you have an overabundance of some particular product, let's say a refrigerator. There are too many refrigerators out there. The refrigerator manufacturers have had to bring them back to the factory. How do you clear the market of that? Well, most of us figure that, you know, you let the price fall. Instead of charging $200 for a refrigerator, maybe the price will drop to $100. And at that point, people say, yeah, I'll bring a new refrigerator. And in a re relatively short period of time, you'd get a clearing of the market. But what Uber and later uh, Roosevelt ended up doing with so much of this was to operate on the premise that prices ought to be stabilized. Prices ought to be set at a particular level. Wages should be set at a particular level, meaning that the market is never going to clear itself. You've taken away the opportunities for the market to clear itself. Well, at this point, uh, prior to FDR getting elected to office, people in the business community, the big corporate boys, um, approached Hoover and FDR uh, with the idea of supporting this SWOP plan as a solution for the price. Hoover, Hoover opposed the idea not because he thought it was invalid in and of itself. I think we had some sense that it would not be uh, permitted under the antitrust laws. I, I am not sure what his thinking was on that, on that score. But the business leaders then turned to Roosevelt. And Roosevelt said, yeah, he would make that his number one priority once he got into office. Uh, that's the first bill he would send to Congress was the uh, bill for uh, the industrial recovery. At that point, and actually earlier than that, but at least by that point in time, the business community loved Roosevelt. I mean, there's so much nonsense. You know, even, even today, you hear people say, well, Roosevelt brought American business kicking and screaming into the 20th century. What utter nonsense. What utter nonsense. Roosevelt's community loved it. As we'll see when we get into the tail end of the years under which this program, the National Industrial Recovery Act, uh, was, was going out of business. When Roosevelt took office in March, that's back in the days when the presidency the change occurred in March. Uh, first thing he sent to Congress was a bill for uh, the what's called the National Indust National Industrial Recovery Act. That was a proposed bill, uh, and un under that system, American industry, commerce, and industry generally would be subject to the kinds of controls that Swope had set forth in his plan you know, a year or so earlier. So the people in an industry could get together, create their own codes of fair competition, 
and have them subject to enforcement by the federal government. Now, a particular business firm wasn't required to participate in the code making process, but they were required to abide by whatever code the members of his industry uh, created. So, as a consequence, some four or 500 codes were adopted from such gigantic types of uh, industries as steel making and auto man automobile manufacturing and the motion picture industry and car industry, et cetera, down to such rather esoteric industries corn cob pipe manufacturing, uh, umbrella handle manufacturing, steel wool manufacturing, things of this sort. And once a number of, a sufficient number of people from each of these industries uh, got together and created these codes of fair competition. And they were approved by the head of the NRA, and by this this time, uh, that head was uh, once the, the the NIRA was set up. Um, it was set up under the administration of a man by the name of General Hugh Johnson. It's always interesting. It should be to all of us how uh, whenever a governmental problem arises or a problem arises that the government wants to involve with, we declare declare war on it, war on poverty, war on crime, war on terror, war on ignorance, war on this, war on that. <clears throat> and if you're going to have something, who do you bring it? Military people. So here came General Hugh Johnson. And Johnson had been the right-hand man of Bernard Baruch back in the days of the War Industries Board. Bernard Baruch, head of the War Industries Board, Hugh Johnson was the main administrator of it. So who better to pick up where the War Industries Board left off uh, than this man? Well, there were a number of journalists around and a few others who were not mesmerized by the NRA. I, I dedicated my book to one of my folk heroes. It was John T. Flynn, who was a journalist who wrote basically with in uh, uh, business journals and so forth, business magazines, and who saw the bulk of what Roosevelt and the New Dealers were doing as a rather fraudulent undertaking, and said so. I thought, well, who better to <laughs> dedicate, dedicate this book to? But somebody, one of these journalists, and I don't remember who it was, uh, started talking about the NIRA as the phrase Nira, as in Nira, my God to thee. Well, General Johnson didn't like this uh, phrase. He had considered the NRA, in his words, not mine, the greatest thing to benefit mankind since Jesus Christ. And so he, of his own volition, just struck out the letter I, in the name of the agency, and it was no longer the National Industrial Recovery Agency, it was now just the National Recovery Agency, or the National Recovery Administration. And his job was to oversee this code making process. And so if people from the corn cob pipe industry or the uh, steel industry or whoever else got together and at a hotel someplace in New York or Pittsburgh or wherever it was to formulate this code of fair competition, uh, he or one of his uh, sub-agents would oversee that. And the substance of what these people wanted to get at in terms of dealing with a code of fair competition was essentially any anything that amounted to aggressive competition 
that resulted in the creation of fundamentally new products, fundamentally new sales practices, anything that was going to disturb the status quo. Had nothing to do with you know, protecting customers from cheap merchandise or fraudulent selling practices or anything like that. It had to do with one business firm uh, using its powers, its capacities, its practice, engaging in practices that destabilized competition in the industry, Me meaning that it was bringing about uh, the kind of aggressive competition that was harmful to the firms who couldn't keep up with the pace. Now, uh, you start going into these into these codes, and there were a lot of <clears throat> industries that were subject to two, three, four, five different codes because of you know they crossed over into from one industry over into another. But for the most part, they involve trade practices within a specific industry. And the, the industry that really attracted my attention was uh, the one in which the participants were engaged in the business of slaughtering chickens. Now keep in mind the 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 NRA was set up for a two year period. And at the end of this two year period there was a provision that it would just go away unless Congress reenacted it. And it was set up in nineteen thirty three and by the late nineteen thirty four and early nineteen thirty five with the NRA set to expire of its own language, and I think it was in June of 1935, efforts were made to want to get the NRA before the Supreme Court, hopefully to have the Supreme Court strike it down from the people who favored markets and from the people who favored the cardinalization of industry to have the Supreme Court you know, put a stamp of approval on it. Well. It's very difficult to get a case up before the courts, much less the Supreme Court, when you're dealing with the relatively short time constraints that you're talking about here, two years. You have to have had cases that have gone far enough through the judicial system to make it ready for judicial determination. There just weren't that many around. And so uh, the parties realized that the one case they had that they thought might have a good chance on this was a case involving a family of kosher poultry slaughters in Brooklyn by the name of Schechter, the Schechter Poultry Corporation. Schechter, the Schechter brothers I think Joseph Schechter uh, are up there with my other <laughs> other folk here. I love these guys. I just uh, they're no longer with us. I'm I'm certain, but uh, here was a little business, and when I say little, I mean little. I drove out one time to the site of where this poultry slaughtering business was operating. The building was gone, but it was on a, a vacant lot that is just like a small vacant lot. This is not some big major corporation that is sprawled out over Pittsburgh or Detroit or Chicago or places like that. It's just some little hole in the wall operation that continued to slaughter poultry according to the kosher method of slaughtering chickens. Aha, the kosher method of slaughtering chickens that they were employing was contrary to the poultry slaughtering code of the NRA. <clears throat> okay, so now we're going to have this case up before the Supreme Court. And to make a long story short, I'll just say that 
uh, the Supreme Court, this is 1935, the Supreme Court found that the activities of the, uh, the Schechter brothers was too localized to really be an activity engaged in commerce. In other words, they were just doing this in Brooklyn, selling the slaughtered chickens to buyers in New York. There's no evidence of being shipped anyplace else. And from a commerce clause perspective, uh, the courts said, no, it just didn't satisfy the uh, commerce clause requirements. There's another provision as well in that um, one of the factors in the uh, in the code making process was that first of all the people creating the codes were people in the industry itself. In other words, people in the steel industry, for example, can get together and formulate rules and regulations for their for their competitors. They would have the force of law. On top of that, <clears throat> the president Roosevelt had the power under the statute to make any modifications in these regulations that he chose. If there was something in the steel code that didn't appeal to him, you know, he could just scratch that out and put in something else. And the Supreme Court sort of got the idea. I think it's <clears throat> it's, a, it's it's an idea that is. <clears throat> the question is now being raised again, <clears throat> whether or not presidents can simply make law on their own volition. And at that point in time, 1935, the court said no. Congress may not delegate its legislative authorities to any other branch of government. And so it got struck down on that basis as well. And, and on that basis, it's probably still good law if the case is ever going to go back up. Uh, with regard to the Commerce Clause, uh, something happened in 1936, some of you may have heard about, and that was that Roosevelt got reelected, and he got reelected in a landslide. Only, only two states voted Republican. The rest of them just overwhelmingly went for, went for Roosevelt. Uh, the Supreme Court got the message. Anyone out there who thinks that the courts are immune from on political pressures, <laughs> you'd better start, you know, looking beyond your high school civics class textbook. This is just not the case, because the Supreme Court had been striking down a lot of Roosevelt's New Deal programs. Uh, but after the election in 1936, when it became evident that this man had a very popular base upon which to draw. And when Roosevelt himself started talking about packing the Supreme Court and doing some other things, and maybe the fear that they might be impeached if they don't go along with it, in 1937, you start getting all these other Commerce Clause cases that uh, started upholding the power of Congress to basically legislate whatever they want to legislate. Getting so bad in one case, Wickard versus Filburn, involving a wheat farmer who was growing wheat on his own farm for consumption on his own farm. Uh, the court said that the local nature of the activity only goes to the question of whether or not Congress chose to regulate it. Which if you read that closely, go back and read it and then reread it, what the court was saying was that the um, scope of the Commerce Clause is determined by what Congress wants to do. If they want to regulate it, it's within commerce. And if not, it's not. In any event, <clears throat> those were some of the pressures that were uh, going on here. And in my In Restraint of Trade book, I, I spent a good deal of time uh, going into business journals, business magazines, Wall Street Journal, New York Times, all kinds of trade association magazines and publications and so forth, and just documenting all of these anti-competitive attitudes. Uh, it's, it's a very heavily footnoted book. And if any of you 
ever would like to just have, have the evidence of here's, here's where people in the steel industry said this or they said that. Uh, it's there. I, I focused on major industries. I didn't do an across the board treatment of all, all industries there. But I focused on industries such as steel, uh, natural resource industries, which are basically uh, oil, coal, and lumber, uh, retailing, and the textile industry. Textile industry was a big promoter of governmental regulation. Uh, this is where they were the creators, basically, of the minimum wage laws uh, for various economic reasons I won't go into right now. But <clears throat> um, you, you can see in all of this <clears throat> just how opposed people in the large, in particular, the larger business enterprises were to <clears throat> the kind of aggressive competition that most of us think of when we talk about a free market. You know, you either make it, you either you either change, uh, or you, know, you go out of business. And when you've gotten to the place that you're an end in yourself, when you start thinking that you're too big to fail, it very easily leads into what we're now experiencing, a business firms that uh, now get billions of dollars in government handouts just to stay afloat. Business firms that live on government contracting, the defense contracting industry, you know, yeah. Boeing Corporation as America's persecuted minority, please. Don't make me, don't make me laugh. <laughs> Northrop Grumman and so forth. Big Pharma, how much of the regulation of what people can put into their bodies is determined by what's the self-interest of the pharmaceutical industry? So forth. Um, and it starts, it starts with this confusion that I think most people have about the difference between the business community and the free market. And I want, I want to emphasize, there are a number of firms out there, and they're usually smaller firms, that really are very supportive of, of free markets. I remember when I was doing research on, on this particular book, I kept running across uh, efforts made by the Illinois Manufacturers Association to oppose all this stuff. And I was like, well, that's interesting. What, who are the Illinois Association, and why aren't they communicating with the National Association of Manufacturers, for example? What I've never, I've never taken the time, and maybe kind of a fun thing to do sometimes, take the time to find out who was the Illinois Manufacturing Manufacturers Association. Sometimes, you know, there's some individual or small group of individuals that uh, see the long-term implications of this and, you know, act accordingly. And maybe that's, maybe that's what it was, but it wasn't an all or nothing thing. It was tended to be you know, the larger the organization was, the larger the business firm was, the less resilient they were, the less adaptive they could be. Um, many of them had too much rigidity built into them. The steel industry is a wonderful example. When you have the open hearth form of steel manufacturing uh, and some fundamental change begins occurring in the manufacturing of steel, what do you do with a steel mill? What do you do with a uh, an assembly line for automobiles when you built your entire operation around that method of production. You know, and then somebody comes along and says, no, we've got, we've got a more effective way of manufacturing steel. You know, <clears throat> wise business leaders now, if they think about it, build resiliency into their, into their structure. I know, I know some people who uh, operated uh, private schools, and when the private school is the operating one in a residential area, the school is designed like a house. 
so that if it stops being a school, you know, it can easily be sold as a residence. At the same time, schools that are operating in a school area have that kind of a commercial design to it. You can turn around and use it as a drive-in bank facility or something of that nature. So if you, if you start building resiliency into something, which means you start building adaptability to the kinds of changes that you find in a competitive market, you have less of, an, uh, less of pressure than what the, the people in the business community were putting together uh, to keep themselves just, just as they are. So I don't know if that's, a, <clears throat> Matt, if that's a convenient place to take up any questions or inquiries. I've been babbling for close to an hour now. I think this is as convenient of a place as any. Uh, if anybody would like to ask questions, you can ask in the little Q&A box there in the upper right. Now, who would you say, uh, from your position of expertise, were some of the biggest villains out of all this? Who were, oh. name some names for us. Oh my. Well, Swoop because he was the, the draftsman of this system would certainly have to be, be if you're looking for looking for villains. I've always been less inclined to look for villains and bad guys and so forth than I am to look at what is what is implicit in, in all of this stuff, what they're doing. Uh, when I see what governments get away with doing, the war system or whatever it may be, uh, the people I really get upset with are most people. Why do, why do we put up with this stuff? Why is it that when, you know, some president or whoever says, we want to go to war with uh, Lower Ruritania, and they say, okay, that's all right, Lower Ruritania. Who was it who said that war was uh, the Americans' way of, uh, was God's way of teaching Americans geography. Uh, you know, whatever the system, you know, we, I, I, I remember when George Bush was president and there was a um, effort made to impeach Bush. And I, I did an article for Lou Rockwell.com that said, no, let's not impeach Bush. Let's impeach the American people. They, they haven't done their end. You know, they should have. <laughs> Started doing some squawking about about this, but there are, there are, there are a number of of people in the industry that you in the various industries, in the banking industry, the uh, steel industry, and so forth that you can point your fingers at. I I so I my inclination is to try and find the heroes, and I love the Schecters. They are just they're my kind of people. It's like. You know, you shouldn't do this to us. We're gonna, we're just in the business of, of providing chickens to our Jewish clientele if they're done in a kosher stuff, and we're gonna keep doing it. We're not. We, we answer to a higher authority, I suppose, would be something that they might might say. Those are people I like. I like the few people who stand up and say, "No, I'm, I'm not gonna do this." Can we blame people for, for being ignorant when kind of the system is set up so the incentives of people, I mean, it, uh, the public choicers call this irrational ignorance. Uh, it's in people's best interest. It, it doesn't cost them uh, enough to surmount the, the barriers uh, to learning about all these issues, to curing ignorance. Uh, it, it's just not not worth it to the individual. So it's kind of, I don't know, you could say it's a, a public goods problem and maybe uh, maybe a, uh, a, a someone, not me, might suggest that government uh, incentivize, uh, give subsidies to to people to, uh, to make government, uh, to uh, learn about why they should make government smaller. I mean, it would fit their, their narrative. It's interesting. One, uh, 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 I'm trying to finish two books right now, and one of them 
uh, has to deal with the topic of epistemology. How do we know what we know? And I've been working on this idea of importance uh, of in intuition and what I call the art of implicit thinking. And that is to become aware of what is implicit in our actions. It may not be predictable. Chaos theory tells us that complex systems are not predictable in terms of outcomes. Um, and so uh, if Uncle Willie drinks a quart of scotch every day, uh, implicit in his action is that he may develop cirrhosis of the liver. Not certain that he will, but it's, it's implicit in that in some place down the road, he may start complaining about pain and suffering and all of that, and his liver may simply go out and that will be, that will be it. Uh, is it possible for us to act in the present uh, with an implicit understanding of what we're doing in the present is going to have longer term consequences? I notice this in terms of, of driving. I drive out on the uh, LA freeways here every day and it, it's, it's very interesting. It, it's, uh, it's amazing how Tens of thousands of people can be driving along at 60, 70 miles an hour, just a few feet apart, and do so without having very many accidents. You, you know, an accident on the freeway is not that common. They happen, but I mean, it's not something you would ordinarily, ordinarily see. Why is? Well, I think part of the reason for that is that if you make a bad decision in in the present, you're going to the call is going to come home to you right now. It's not going to be twenty or thirty years from now the way inflationary policies do or uh, health practices do something of that. You're going to feel it right this right this instant, and so you have you, you you're in a situation where where the future and the present are at the time, if, if you follow what I'm, what I'm saying there. In other words, the, the present contains the future. If you don't make the right, right decision, you might be dead. If you don't make the right decision, you might be in, you know, in, in a hospital for you know, six, six or eight months, like that. Why, or is it possible for us to think that way in terms of the kinds of decision making we have where you know it doesn't have that immediate impact that you can favor a particular course of action and you know at least implicitly that if you keep this up you're going to have you're likely to have uh, you know, cirrhosis of the liver let's say in my example it's not certain that you will i i know people who have been chain smokers all their lives and they're perfectly healthy. But it's, <laughs> I'm willing to bet that people who, who do that uh, don't, that they develop health problems. Can we, can we recognize that in the present? And if we can recognize that in the present with respect to our own daily lives, can we recognize the cost that our children and our grandchildren and great grandchildren are gonna have to pay sometime down the road uh, for our refusal to act on the on, on that premise uh, one of the thoughts that comes to mind wouldn't it have been nice if the people who were working on developing the atomic bomb back in the late 30s and 40s if they might have taken into consideration what the long-term implications of that would be wesley asks what could counteract the large incentives to use government power to entrench corporate interest, uh, to rent seek? Probably the only thing that comes to mind is an increased understanding on the part of people to just not put up with it anymore. I, I find some examples of this in various protest movements that are going on all over the world. People go out and protest uh, banking practices, protest the Federal Reserve System. 
I don't remember this 10 years ago. And I have to admit that I think that uh, some of what Ron Paul did was uh, very successful in awakening people to what some of these what some of these problems are. But I, I it goes back to the people who have to pay the price for this. If if I can do something to you that benefits me and you don't object to it and you don't complain and you don't walk away and you don't do anything else, uh, what incentive do I have to to stop? If once I've decided I want to follow that course of action, what incentive do I have to stop unless it comes from you? This is what a lot of people don't understand about the so-called terrorist uh, activities. You know, it's what we now call blowback. If you keep doing this, it's, it's going to return and, and, and hit you in the rear end. And so you better become aware that, uh, that Richard Weaver had a, a book by the title, Ideas Have Consequences. Well, actions have consequences. Things that I do have consequences. There are costs associated with it. And so much of what we do involves uh, a willingness to impose the costs of our actions upon others who really don't want to want to, want to bear them. You know, I want to I want to bring an NFL football team to Los Angeles, let's say, but I don't want to build a stadium. That's expensive. So we'll get the taxpayers to do that. And this is this is commonplace. This is, this is where so-called environmental problems arise. People who are upset with uh, you know, pollution and so forth go off on the wrong wrong footing on that. So, oh, you're damaging the environment. No, you're committing property trespasses. You're imposing the costs of your decision making onto others when you spew smoke out into the atmosphere when you. Don't toxic waste into rivers or into the underground water system or whatever it may be, uh, you're not internalizing your costs. It's appropriate that economists refer to this as socializing the costs. It is socialism. The way of saying, I don't want to have to bear costs, you bear them. Um, so I, I think in response to his question, it becomes challenging to help other people learn what is being done at their expense. And I, I think I think there's been a good deal of this. I think what, what Ron has done has done has been very helpful, but I, I think it's also being done by uh, some organization that's called Liberty.me. Have you heard of them? <laughs> of course, yeah. LouRockwell.com and you know antiwar.com and all kinds of sources here that um, are very effective and and believe me the the power structure knows that the free flow of information and ideas is a threat to their power hillary wants to have a gatekeeper gatekeeper not just everybody should be able to get out on the internet and put out their ideas you know they should go through me first grief and people become aware of that. You know, just particularly learning basic economics. Most people think they un understand economics because they can balance their checkbook every month. Well, there's something more to it than that. And you know, for people who really need an introduction to that, I've I've always recommended Henry Hazlitt's work, uh, ec Economics in One Lesson, as a good starting point. You can get into on Mises and Rothbard and others later on, but just as a footstep in, into understanding a system that most people just are completely ignorant about. We really are. This is where we spend not just a third of our day, <clears throat> of our work day, it's probably where we spend the bulk of our time w wondering and worrying and so forth about uh, how we're going to survive in this world, you know, we don't understand the system. We've had, we've allowed the media, we've allowed the school system and so forth to de define economics <clears throat> in ways that are suitable to the institutional order, not to us. And so, um, no, I think 
beginning there is probably the best way. Do I think that getting into politics is a good way? No. No, I don't. I've never thought, or at least I haven't thought for many decades now that political action is a way of resolving any of this. And reminded of Frank Shodorov's old line that I've used so many times and said that the problem with this approach is you want to clean up the horror but keep the business intact. And uh, oh, no, it, it goes on inside your head, it goes inside my head. How do, how, how do we help other people and, and ourselves? How do we learn more about, about what we need to do? I, I, I write for that reason. I, I have a hard time writing unless I'm going to learn something in the process. I can't, I can't write about things I already know. I really can't. It's just like, oh, I don't want to do that. I already know that. Why, why should I write it down? Uh, but if there's something I can use to kind of flesh out my understanding in that, that it clear up some details that I haven't really thought through, yeah, that, then it's... Uh, she asks, what would you say is the best history reference to show returning soldiers and veterans the end game of our current government's actions? Uh, something like, okay, we did this, and this was the clear result of that. Have them go visit a veterans hospital. I think any young man or woman who's thinking about joining the military should, and the, the parents or brothers and sisters of this person should take them up to a, a veterans hospital and just walk them through and see. These are the ones who survived. Um, and then make them aware of the fact that even the even the the War Department I don't call it the Defense Department anymore it's the War Department that's what they called it when I was a kid so that's what it still is the War Department uh, informs us now that there are twenty an average two veterans who commit suicide every day now think about that. Think about the, the, the implications of that. And these are the ones who commit suicide. These are the ones who have just given up. They just can't. And, and, and I might add, these are not just veterans of the Iraq and Afghan war and so forth. They can go back into probably veterans of World War II and Korea and so forth. But still, every day, 22 guys who have been soldiers decide to do themselves in. Why? And what about the ones who don't? What about the ones who, whose lives are just as badly ruined? Uh, you know, it's, the truth is out there. It's a matter of finding it and communicating it to, to other people. Maybe you can get on Russia Today, <laughs> the one news channel that actually gets into some of this stuff. So, So with, with all of this, uh, getting back to the, the subject of your, your talk a little more, how could Ayn Rand, as smart as she was, have missed the depth of this collusion between big business and the state? I don't know. And she may, she may have seen it. I, I, I suspect that she did. But the way she formulated it as you know, being a persecuted minority, I, if she was saying that uh, free trade, people who insist on free trade or persecuted minority, okay, that, that, that can make some sense. But the idea you know, that people in the industry, you have to, from a free market perspective, I always approach uh, issues like this from the question, who would have an incentive to do something, whatever it might be? Who would have an incentive to put together a program like this? I've, I've gotten into discussions and sometimes arguments with people that say, well, I've always taken the position that these regulatory agencies were created at the behest of people in the industry to regulate competition and to stabilize economic conditions in their favor. And I've, I've had a number of free market people say, no, these agencies were set up and People in the business community just took them over. And the question always comes back, who would have had the incentive to set them up in the first place? 
why, why would a whole bunch of congressmen, a whole bunch of senators sent back to Washington desire to regulate the railroad industry or to regulate Uh oh, looks like we lost Butler there. Hopefully we can get him back uh, momentarily here. In the meantime, I'll let people... Oh wait, here we go. Uh, let's see, Butler, if you can click the, uh, the little camera button at the top of the screen. If uh, Brittany's around, she, she knows where that button is. It looks like a little circle on top of a triangle. In the meantime here, I'll let people know what's going on in the next uh, next week or so at Liberty Me Live. On Saturday night, we have Zach Goschenauer. Uh, he's going to be talking about the legacy of Gordon Tulloch and public choice economics, which fascinating subject. Uh, if you aren't familiar with it, definitely come. If you are familiar, you should come then too. It's going to be a, a good time and we're going to have a, a really cool discussion. It's something we don't often get enough uh, public content on on public choice economics. Uh, it, it's not like the Austrian school where you can find just about everything online. So that should be interesting. It's Saturday night at I believe 8 p.m. Sunday night Jeffrey Tucker is going to continue his uh, Liberty Classics series. Uh, Monday night we've got a, a talk from um, a professor at, uh, I think he's at uh, Western Carolina University. It's on uh, one reason why education is overrated. It's Professor Stephen Miller. And that's going to be a, a really interesting talk. I've heard him give a few of those comments. It's good stuff. Tuesday night, uh, we've got a talk by uh, Angela Keaton and Lucy Steigerwald of antiwar.com. It should be fun. Uh, Anti-War always uh, puts on a good show and both Angela and Lucy are really excellent and know just about everything about everything war related. Uh, and then we're taking a break of course for Christmas for a few days and we'll be back next Saturday with a uh, Bitcoin live talk with Mark Rees. Uh, let's see. Uh, let me check to see if uh, Butler or his his daughter have tried to contact me by email or anything. Doesn't look like it. Uh, well, uh, we'll hold out here for just another minute and hopefully we can get them back. Uh, as always, I'd love to hear what you guys are, are interested in seeing at Liberty Me Live. We've got some great stuff lined up for January with Walter Block, Michael Humer. Uh, I believe we're going to have uh, Larry Reed and some others. We've got just uh, always uh, got something interesting coming up. I like to make this interesting just for my own sake. It makes work more fun. Uh, but I, I want to tailor this to whatever you guys are interested in. So if you can send me some some suggestions, I always uh, at least look into them. And we've had a lot of people on here who were originally suggested by our members. Um, well, it looks like we may not be getting uh, Butler back on here. Um, oh wait, I think I had audio there for a second. Okay, there we go. Am I oh, back? Yep. yep, I can see that. I can hear you. Now, are we back in business? We are back in business. Very good. I, I was enjoying listening to your 
list of uh, speakers to be, especially when you <laughs> mentioned Angela. She is she's something else. People, when you're she a good, is. she's a, she's one of my favorite people. So, yeah, but don't tell her that. <laughs> <laughs> she, she's always uh, really fun, and uh, we had her and Scott Horton on together uh, a couple oh, of months, yeah, yeah. and you know they were just the quick back and forth, and they both know so much. I mean, they went yeah. through uh, just decades of really in-depth history in in the Middle East in in just uh, just over an hour, and it was incredible. It was it was just a really amazing show that yeah. they put on. Uh, let's see. I think we were in the middle of the question. Uh, we I asked how Rand could have missed the the depth of collusion. I think you answered uh, the bulk of that. So we can go ahead and move on to another question. If okay. unless you sure. had anything you wanted to add. Um, no, I, so I, I I would just would just add. Uh, I, I'm not being much critical of Rand. I think that she had done certainly a great deal. Uh, to help me <laughs> formulate some of my own thinking, even though I'm not an objectivist, but kind of forcing you into confronting these questions. And this is why when I'm listening to the list of people that you're going to bring on, they're going to, some are going to come from slightly different perspectives. This is the way it should be. This is the way you harmonize, you, the way you, uh, you get into the deeper levels of questioning that really most understand. If you just listen to someone who you already agree with, you're wasting your time. You know, but when you have people who bring up something you hadn't thought about before, and then you're kind of forced to think about that. Uh, this is what I've always liked about the Socratic method of teaching. I, I was experienced that when I was in law school. My one of my all-time favorite professors, and just never answered any questions. You know, it was just always another question, another question, another question, another question. And it makes you think, your, think yourself through all of this. I had a woman in one of my classes one time a number of years ago. Uh, I had a rather complicated hypothetical that was thrown out there. And they'd already read some cases and so forth. And so I asked her, uh, well, how do you think a court would decide that question? She says, I don't know. I said, well, if you did know, what would your answer be? And she proceeds to lay out a really decent answer. And when she finished, she looked up and said, I, I knew that, didn't I? And I said, well, you seem to do a pretty good job on it. And she said, so why did I just immediately react and say, I don't know? I said, well, maybe you should ponder that question as you drive home from school tonight. And why do we do this? Why we just, I don't know. I don't want to think about that. No, 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 no. Uh, think about it. If it bugs you, you know, think about it. I think my professors in law school might have been a little happier if I had just stuck with I don't know, because a lot of times they uh, <laughs> didn't like my answers because I, I was coming from a, a radically different perspective. <laughs> um, now, so yeah. in a free society, yeah. What keeps businesses from becoming institutions, from becoming ends in themselves? Uh, are you are are you prepared to say to that firm, no matter how bad you perform, no matter how incompetent you are, you've got a wonderful logo, you've got a building you're operating from and so forth. So we got to keep you going. Um, why would we do that? See, the market, the market itself, if you allow the market to operate, you keep the government out of uh, the market, puts these p people in a position of having to change. If, if we don't, the people who were manufacturing buggy whips at the time the automobile came into existence, what did they do? Well, they could either say, doggone it, we just need to improve the quality of our buggy whip. We need a more attractive buggy whip, so forth. The more intelligent firms, I suspect, probably said, well, maybe we ought to get into something like making batteries or something of that nature, you know, to change. 
And a lot of us are reluctant to change. You know, we don't, we don't want that. You know, you're, you're seeing that right now is you, you see a lot of the, the structure that's going on in our society, the vertically structured social relationships are collapsing in favor of more horizontally networked patterns. And people who've been, who've enjoyed the vertically structured top down model of doing things, um, the news media is, is one example. Uh, they don't like the idea that, my goodness, anyone can get out there on the internet and, oh my goodness, they can say whatever they want. As though people on ABC and CNN don't say whatever they want, you know. It's, you know, it's, it's a difference in how you approach this. You know, are we, are we communicating with one another or to one another? And I, 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 I'm very optimistic on all of this. And I think one of the reasons I'm optimistic, is I think it's just technologically so. Uh, why is the Soviet Union no longer with us? Is it because all the Russians suddenly started reading Atlas Shrugged? Say, hey, guys, hey, come over here. Look, they read so she said, and she's from Russia. She should know uh, the hell with this. <laughs> the system, let's become laissez-faire capitalists. No, the system just could no longer sustain itself. It had, too many contradictions, conflicts, you know, falsehoods, everything else built into it. It just couldn't sustain itself. That's where we are in this country right now. Too many contradictions in the in the institutional systems that we have. And you know, it just won't be able to sustain itself. Goody. goody. And if, if something is unsustainable, it will stop. It will stop. Uh, it may not do and, nice things once it and, stops, and, but it, it will among, stop. And among healthy, rational people, they will come up with some better way of doing things. Hmm. Yeah, I, I think it's really interesting to point out that you know a lot of the successful uh, companies that aren't uh, that aren't the ones that you know the big names that kind of uh, took over parts of the government. Their their organizations like, like Nintendo. A, a lot of them uh, started doing something completely different. Uh, Nintendo. Mm -hmm. uh, which now makes video games, used to make playing cards, and then it was a cab company at one point. And then it ran a chain of, of hotels where uh, young couples could just rent a room for a few hours to uh, do, do something. And uh, Whatever you would do and, in a room for two hours that you're going to rent for. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah. And, and now they're a video game company, and and yeah. they also own the Seattle Mariners. Yeah, well, it's um, the 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 book. I'm, I'm trying to remember the author's name. It's slipping my mind right now. But the uh, a book called Order Out of Chaos. Oh, I, who wrote? That? Um. Anyway. Uh, in an interesting vision, which turned into a, uh, a, a television series on business for it would start out in some guy's basement, and then all of a sudden you're, you're building uh, a system, a, a, a larger building that's employing two or three hundred people, but at uh, at each level you're building resiliency into the system. You're not operating on the assumption it's always going to be this way. No, it might be better be flexible enough to be able to adapt to something else if we need to. And one company I can think of in particular, the guy started out making bicycle handles and then motorcycle handles, and then it mor morphed into uh, uh, ski poles, and then eventually ended up the guy manufacturing ski clothing same business same operation but he had enough resiliency there that he could go from making bicycle handles to ski clothing and there's uh, a there's a, a company that's recently I mean, it's now a multi-billion dollar company just over the last few years uh called airbnb uh that provides you know a, a decentralized bed and breakfast service allows people to list their homes as B and B's and how they got started. It, originally, uh, I forget what they were 
going to do, but they were having trouble making it work. And to get them sell, to be able to pay their rent, they started renting out a room in the apartment they were working out of airbeds. So they called it an air bee. <laughs> and, and it took off. Yeah, yeah. Thriving on Chaos was the name of the book. People could find it on, on the internet. I can't, I just can't recall the author's name. He was a very interesting guy to listen to and to read. It, Thriving on Chaos, but it's uh, Tom Peters, uh, I think. Tom Peters, that's who it is. Yes, Tom Peters, thank you. Uh, you know, you, to have that resiliency, I think you have to be open to the idea of change. It sounds, it sounds fairly obvious. How many of us are not? How many of us think, well, I'm starting this particular enterprise, it's going to be this way forever? You know, no, what if it's not? Do you think that uh, our current business climate is getting to be where it's it's better for that kind of thinking? I mean, certainly there's a this movement in the current entrepreneurship uh, literature called the Lean Startup Movement that's all about uh, being very agile and small and just having what you need to, to get to the next place and having iterations and, and testing what your, your, what the consumers want. Do you think that that's a, a greater trend? I don't know if that's a greater trend. It's certainly a better way of, of doing things. It, it's the contrast between the traditional model, which is we're too big to fail, save us, we want to run the system to suit our particular interests. Um, you know, the persecuted minority <laughs> approach that, some people like to imagine. Um, but the other, what you're talking about is a, a different attitude within the marketplace uh, in which people do have a more of an entrepreneurial spirit. Um, and why not? You know, this is, this, is, this is the nature of who we are as human beings. You know, we are creative. We are self-directed. We're self-motivated. And the fact that other people are kind of destroying our civilized society by doing the things that conducting wars and looting one another and having big payoffs to uh, favored crony capitalists and so forth uh, doesn't mean that there aren't other options for people who want to do it another way. But in all involved, well, uh, I think the lack of structure yeah, we're we're at about an hour and a half here. It's it's probably time. As much fun as we're having, it's probably time to uh, to wrap it up for the night. But Let's luckily, we're level. gonna have you back on, I believe, January eighth, and you'll be, uh, about uh, boundaries of order, private property as a social system. Hope to see everybody back for that, and hope to see you all back for. Uh, some of the cool stuff we've got going on here this week at Liberty Me Live. So thank you so much. It's been tremendously enlightening. You know so much about all of these things. I I'm glad we could have you on here so you can share your wisdom. Thanks so much, everyone. Take well, well, th thank you for having me. The next one is going to be in two weeks? Uh, it's uh, three weeks, I believe. Um, okay. Because two weeks would be January 1st. Oh, three weeks? Yeah. Three weeks. All right. What better time? <laughs> <laughs> okay. Take care. Thank you much. Have a great night, everyone. Yep.